All right, it is January the 3rd, 2013. Uh, it's, you know, the after we are having the after effects, we, we, we know what the um, uh, results were. Uh, if, if you've seen the other videos that and, and interviews I've done with libertarianprogressive.com, uh, where we have interviewed the most independent third party candidates uh, that were running in the year 2012, who were actually on the ballot and had a legitimate chance to win, um, then uh, then that's what libertarianprogressive.com is. And now it's 2013, we don't have elections this year. Uh, we're continuing doing interviews. Uh, today we have uh, Anthony Knoll, the, uh, one of the co-founders of the New Progressive Alliance. And, um, and actually you could view the uh, website at newprogs.org, N-E-W-P-R-O-G-S.org. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure. Anthony, um, do appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, discuss the issues of the day so we can, um, uh, basically I'd say, I mean, if, if you know who Howard Dean is, if you know who Ron Paul is, if you know who Barack Obama is or, or Mitt Romney, then, um, you, you know, you probably would be interested in this interview. And even if you don't, uh, you might even be more interested. Um, it, it's kind of funny. I was just thinking that it seems like um, as far as voter turnout goes, it's like the seniors who turn out most of the time, and it's younger people who don't seem to as much, although there's gaining enthusiasm and, uh, sometimes. Uh, I would think it'd almost be the reverse, uh, but I guess I, I'm wrong about that. But you know, old older people who've been around longer, pr you know, might get more dismayed with the system. Um, you know, thinking that you know the politicians they just give promises. I mean, if we look at some of the debates that we saw, we could compare it to like a debate of Nixon and Kennedy, and it, it's almost you know the exact same issues. I mean, not much has. There's not much new under the sun, and, and young people... It's funny how things never change, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you'd think young people would be more, you know, apt to believe in change, more youthful, more hopeful, uh, you know, not so um, run down into the grind. And, uh, but, um, I mean, that's just kind of, you know, labeling people as groups and not looking at them as individuals, per se, but it does seem kind of a pattern. Uh, so... The New Progressive Alliance, I, I was um, looking at that, uh, you know, within the last year. It seemed very interesting. Seems, you know, somewhat a similar title and spirit to libertarianprogressive.com. Anthony, I, I noticed one other thing, uh, or, or Tony, um, is that on the um, uh, free and equal uh, elections, uh, you, you guys were one of the sponsors of that, and that was pretty uh, neat. And so you're definitely... Um, uh, on your main page, too, uh, talking about um, how, how many of the people that you guys had uh, endorsed, uh, y you know, got uh, a chance in these elections. So, I mean, it looks like you're trying to influence, um, uh, you, you know, the election process, uh, so to say. So if you could tell us just a bit about yourself, what, what got you motivated, um, and Absolutely. Um, I, I want to just thank you for, for taking the time to speak with me today, first of all, Tom. And, and um, I have, I have uh, cruised through your website a little bit. I, I really uh, like what I, what I see there at, um, at uh, Libertarian Progressive. Uh, and, and I think that um, I think that we're kind of speaking the same language in, in many ways. Um, the, what, what really got me involved, and I'll, I'll be uh, really blunt about it, I worked real hard to get Barack Obama elected uh, the first time around. And as soon as he uh, appointed uh, Rahm Emanuel and, and Tim Geithner, I knew I'd made a huge mistake. <laughs> um, I was really disappointed with, with those choices on his part. I should say I've, I've never been a registered Democrat. Um, I never intend to be one. I'm, I'm registered independent myself and always will be. Um, but, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I bought into the, the same thing that so many Americans bought into with, with Obama, that uh, he was going to be a different kind of guy and turns around and, you know, hires a couple of Clintonites. Um, and uh, that, was, that was really depressing for me in, in many ways. Um, and uh, it only, only took uh, really that, um, those, those couple of decisions, and those actually came, you know, even before his inauguration, um, for me to decide that something had to be done. And then, of course, um, the way that he just folded up the tent on on any kind of real um, health insurance reform was another uh, sort of um, uh, genesis uh, for me of, of trying to get something started. And, and the way it started was uh, really quite organically. I, I had been posting 
to um, firedoglake.com um, on their uh, reader site for some time. And of course, you know, in, in doing that on blogs, you get to know how different people feel. And a few of us sort of uh, broke away and, and got on a Google group and started kicking around some ideas for what we thought needed to happen. And, and very honestly, um, I think what's needed is a, is a second progressive era um, in, in America. And, and all of us seem to agree to that. Um, there were a couple of folks who wanted to take more radical action, um, which is not how I'm put together at all. Um, I, I have nothing against marching in the streets. Um, I think that frankly, eventually that's going to be necessary. Um, it's always been necessary to affect profound social change in this country. So I don't see, you know, this current era as being any different. But um, until we get to that, uh, we have to hit people when they're paying attention. And when people are most paying attention is during what is essentially a, a pretty rigged electoral process right now. So um, to the extent possible, um, organizations that are interested in, in bringing about change need to, need to challenge the entrenched organizations that are out there trying to maintain the status quo. Um, organizations, uh, at least on the on the left side, I would say, such as Move On, Progressive Democrats of America, the uh, Progressive uh, Change Campaign Committee, these are these are all organizations on the progressive side which talk a great game about changing the Democratic Party and doing it from within and holding them accountable. And of course, when push comes to shove, none of that really happens. Um, What's different about the new progressive alliance, I think, um, and what we try to uh, ensure is different about us, is um, – are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Okay, okay, I just heard a click. Um, what I try to ensure is different about us uh, through our volunteers um, is that uh, we do not lightly give our endorsements um, to candidates, as you noted uh, on, our, on the front of our uh, – web page right now if folks go to uh, N-E-W-P-R-O-G-S dot org, they will see that uh, we endorsed uh, a pretty good number of independent um, candidates, Green Party candidates. I think there are a couple of libertarians in there as well. And um, we only did that once they agreed to our platform, which is also posted at that website. We call it the Unified Platform. And the reason for that is um, in the first progressive era in our nation, um, it was a, a unification of really disparate groups that enabled the kinds of changes that Americans have um, grow to count on um, since that time. And, um, I mean, we're talking everything from women's suffrage. Um, they they kind of hit uh, one, one clunker with... Um, Prohibition. With, with prohibition, but they unfortunately, it. but right. and they did. Yes, that's that's exactly right. Uh, direct election of senators. You know, a lot of people. It's, it's kind of uh, unfortunate how how few people realize that it didn't used to be that we we directly elected our senators. They used to be appointed by state legislatures. Um, that was another change uh, that that the progressive era brought about, and of course the progressive income tax. Um, so. And, and, and in doing this, the, the groups that, uh, that joined together were everything from labor organizations, which, you know, that well, the, was also the dawn of the labor movement. Yeah, the work week, um, right? Uh, the 40 hours, wasn't that introduced sometime, or was that later, right? Yes, it, it was a little bit later in the 20th century, but yes, the, the foundations of it, and of course, child labor laws, um, you know, those in the late 18th century. Wage. I'm sorry, the late, the late 19th century. Yeah, those, those were enacted. Um, and, and the people that joined together were, were from every political party, literally, uh, from communists to socialists to Republicans to Democrats, and um, people from every socioeconomic um, strata. Uh, you, had, you had doctors, lawyers, laborers, you had freed slaves, um, just, just all sorts of different people who recognize that what's happening here basically is, is corporate rape. Um, you yeah, know, the, the major you corporations. Still, you still I'm sorry? Had, uh, you, at that time, you still had people that were probably alive from the Civil War era. I mean, um, like That's you said, exactly you were, right. That's exactly right, and people, you know, the, the 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 thing that's missing in our in our current, you know, in the culture wars that continue to be played out is is context. 
Um, and, and the more that people can look back and see what worked in the past, and it's true if, if you look at any major movement, you can, you can look again at the New Deal, you can look again at the Civil Rights Movement. It's always eventually led to people getting into the streets, but, um, well, you know, context, eventually... You have to have that context. I mean, to say this is... Don't I mean another thing that's happened in this era, and, and maybe I'll continue on. It, and, and it kind of you know the foundations were laid, I think, since the printing press. But uh, I mean, before the printing press, people didn't really have a context, um, you know. And, and th this is really one of the first times in history where the mass populace has a has a context. I mean, we didn't even have one before, so we're just perpetually, you know, just you know, kicking the stones down the street per se. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And and you know, in order, in order to stop doing that, it, 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 I think it's going to take a pretty great awakening because so many people are just you know from a very young age they're inculcated with the belief that voting, you know, going out and voting, you're doing your duty, you're doing what what is expected of you. And and of course, when the only two options that are offered are are you know vanilla and vanilla with a bit of a swirl, um, <laughs> there's 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 really not any any true choice. Um, so well, that does so, sound like an exciting time in in history. I, I mean, a progressive era. I mean, that's when you know Teddy Roosevelt was there, and and I don't mean to say like he was the driving force or anything like that. If anything, he was just part of the culture, and and, and maybe the people drove him. But um, well, going through the platform though, I think that's pretty important. I mean, um, can you tell us like you know just stream through the platform really quick? Uh, yeah, I'd I'd be happy to do that, and I should I should just note for for you know listeners that um, within within our platform we've we've tried to set it up in a way that makes it very easy to read with with basically a header to to get the main point across, and then you can read as much or as little as you want by by collapsing stuff below below each plank. But um, our, our platform is very straightforward. It uh, begins with peace. The number one plank is peace, peace first. Um, in a world of uh, increasing population, we believe that diminishing resources and unstable climate is a world poised for conflict. And, of course, we're seeing that play out on, on any number of stages. It seems an ever-increasing number of stages. Uh, full employment at a living wage for all people is number two, saving the environment, uh, a real social safety net, Medicare for all, fair trade, um, human rights and civil liberties, election reform, corporate accountability and corporate reform, and infrastructure investment and ownership, meaning publicly owned um, infrastructure. Well, just go um, through a couple. I mean, none of these are issues that either the Republicans or the Democrats are doing, and, and hence, you know, the reason you, you know of your organization. And uh, I mean, really, who got the? Um, uh, the healthcare reform. I, I mean, really, what it is is, uh, it's it's a public. What what they passed was really um, health, uh, really healthcare. They they gave a public option to the uh, insurance companies. Basically, the the insurance companies now have a big public option where every, everyone has to buy their products. Um, and and a public option wasn't even debated from uh, the Congress or Obama, really, except maybe for a handful of people. Well, and and actually, you know, if you actually look at the history of it, and and um, you know, I'm a I'm a big supporter of of Fire Dog Lake. I know that uh, that site rubs some people the wrong way, but. I, I just feel that Jane Hampshire and, and her staff do a great job. And one of the stories that Jane broke um, that is still just ridiculously undercovered um, is the way that uh, Barack Obama bargained away the public option um, long before he was still saying publicly that, uh, you know, it, it was on the table. And um, the only evidence, the only further evidence of that that, that one needs is, is to remember that Dennis Kucinich, um, the weekend before the vote was going to be taken on the final health care plan, was back on local Cleveland TV saying, there is no way I'm going to vote for anything that doesn't have a public option. He was one of a very few holdouts that were doing that. And uh, Barack Obama flew to Cleveland in Air Force One, flew Dennis Kucinich back to D.C. on Air Force One, and by the time they got off the plane in D.C., Kucinich said that he was going to vote for the plan. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist <laughs> to figure out what happened there. Uh, Kucinich's funding was threatened by the DNC if he didn't fall in line, and he did. 
Um, you know, was I on the plane? Do I have evidence of this? No, but the circumstantial evidence is very damning. Yeah, I remember. And, and, and nowadays, like, you know, it's great as people can go onto YouTube or whatever and find all those clips. De Dennis Kucinich, I mean, I admire him a lot. I think, you, you know, he makes a lot of good points. He did seem like he kind of, you, you know, um, bended on this one a little more, you know, maybe cross. Well, he didn't principles. bend, he caved. He and, caved. and, you know, the, the and what a lot of other people, uh, you know, don't realize, a lot of folks just generally in the electorate don't realize that, uh, you know, 30 senators and 60 representatives all signed a pledge not to vote for anything without a public option. And in the end, every one of them did. And those pledges were their idea. Nobody made them, you know, nobody held those guys at gunpoint and said, you got to sign this thing. They all chose to do it in an effort to put pressure on Barack Obama. And by the time that they did that, Obama had already made a deal with the insurance companies that there would be no public option. So, um, you know, the, the, some people would call that hypocrisy, but of course, I think that, I think that it was an effort that was done in, in good faith initially, um, on the part of, of those senators and representatives. And somebody told them, you know, who's actually calling the tune and it's not them, it's their donors. Um, so, so in 2013, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think there needs to be a stronger contrast. I mean, Dennis Kucinich, some people have heard of him. A, a lot of progressives have heard of him. Even a lot of libertarians have heard of him. But um, if, if you're someone who's not really into politics, I mean, Dennis Kucinich, you know, could be just, you know, just another person on the street or, or, or something. And um, the only thing that I think that's really going to get people's attentions is like if, if it's not a Republican or a Democrat, um, because if they're if if they're a Dennis Kucinich, but they still have that D on their name, uh, you, you know, people aren't going to really pay it too much fanfare. But I mean, if, if like there were like 10, 20, whatever, Greens, maybe Libertarians, Independents in the Congress, uh, people would have to, um, uh, you know, kind of think outside their, you know, predictive programmed uh, paradigm. I, I mean, they'd have to be like, what well, this is something that they would have to take notice to. I mean, it's just kind of like... Um, what, a lot of things that we see is just what our brain tells us. I mean, it's been proven in science, and, and if we constantly see that D, 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 I mean, it's going to give the psyche that things are still the same. And, and they are still the same when you can take someone up in an airplane and, and bring them down. You, you know, it's almost like yep. it's not even, maybe it's a clone of Dennis Kucinich for that day or something because he didn't <laughs> act like him, you know. I mean, he, he, Yeah, yeah, he had all the, mo had all the moves right, <laughs> but what was coming out of his mouth was not anything you'd expect from from the Kucinich of old, but... I mean, there's got to be um, a point that people are dissatisfied. I mean, it's even if they elect, like, a lot of different... And they should. I mean, we can do both. We can, you know, try to influence the primaries in the Democrat and Republican Party. I mean, why not? I mean, that's just being a smart and that's, sh shopper. That's part of our... Yeah, part of our strategy is is that we... we The only time that we'll support a Democrat or a Republican is if, A, they have endorsed our platform, and, B, they are challenging only in a primary, um, one of their, you know, own partisans. Right. Um, but in the so, general election, I mean, it's going to pay off more having, you know, people that, like, by, by saying, like, I pick a Green Party, I'm saying, like, I exactly. completely, I'm over you. I completely, there's no more chances. I completely reject, you, you, you know, what's been going on. The two-party system. Yeah, and we, you know, we, like, like you, uh, we call it a duopoly. It is. Uh, I also, one of my favorite terms is the uniparty. Because it really is just one party with with two branches, two wings, if you will, um, that uh, present themselves as as always opposed to each other and having vigorous debate. When in fact, you know, they they say what they have to say for three or four months prior to an election, and then they go back to Washington and do what they're going to do and what they've always done since you know over the last fifty years, I would say. Um, and, and, and before, but, uh, at least there was still some vestige of, of, uh, progressivism, um, still surviving, I think when JFK was elected. Um, but you know, it, it's it, ever since the progressive era of, of 1892 to, to 1917, it, it has dwindled, um, consistently. And of course that was the real, those 25 years were the real heyday. It's when those amendments, those constitutional amendments we talked about before were enacted, um, and and the progressives who influenced FDR's cabinet, Francis Perkins, Henry Wallace, um, 
the, those are the folks that that was the period when those folks were really invigorated and ignited. And without that having happened, the New Deal never would have occurred because FDR didn't want it. Um, FDR, while he eventually did enact it, he was dragged kicking and screaming to uh, to do it by by other forces. And um, people who make an argument that, you know, we can do the same thing with the Democratic Party today are just completely ignorant of the grand scale, the huge um, for-profit corporation it is. I don't care if it's registered as a nonprofit or not. Well, just look at every single um, uh, platform that you have. Peace, I, I mean, that that is probably the biggest way we could save our, our budget, uh, for one thing. And plus, I, I mean, just the other... Um, benefits, uh, include, but peace itself, um, you, you know, that, and actually an economy seems to work better when countries are trading and getting along instead of a constant threat of war as well. I mean, it's good for, if you're, you know, a defense contractor, but for everyone else, I, I mean, we're paying their welfare and, uh, and then a living wage, um, you know, that's something that could be a little divisive between libertarians and progressives. But I think most people in the United States would, you know, think the minimum wage should be about like $10 an hour, saving the environment. That's one thing I think, you know, people can all agree on. That there's not much being done, but I, I think, um, I don't think, you, you know, I mean, there's a lot of schemes. I, I'm kind of wary about a... Uh, cap and trade system but i mean as far as you, you, you know finding and in, investing in new forms of energy you know being proactive about it instead of just defensive which is adding taxes onto usage just you know introducing whole new um uh, propulsion systems and, and etc and energy generating things um solar etc um would be good well, and, and, and genetically modified cells. foods and and you know etc i mean that's yeah yeah, and and you know the the thing, the interesting thing about libertarianism, and and you know I think it's unfortunate, and this is one of those bridges. If we're really going to unify folks, one of one of one of those bridges that need to be built, a gap that that we really need to to get past, is you know a lot of progressives have a knee jerk reaction that if someone says they're a libertarian, uh, that they're just on a complete flight of fancy and that they believe that people should be free to do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, that there's no responsibility that comes with that freedom. And while there are certainly some libertarians who, who take it to that extent, just as sure as there are plenty of progressives who have crazy pie-in-the-sky notions, the, the fact is that most of the libertarians I know want to defend personal freedom, but they also recognize that those freedoms do come with, with a certain amount of responsibility. Um, you know, it's, it, it's okay to be, um, to be against um, too much government spending, but only to the extent that you also recognize that, that you're using government programs. You know, they, they recently did a, a survey, and I think it was reported in the, in the Washington Post, the, the results of it, but in, in rural areas, people who claim to be conservatives or, or very strong uh, libertarians um, tend also to say that they have never utilized a government program. And when the researchers looked into the validity of that claim, those people were using government programs without even realizing that they were, um, whether it was uh, farming subsidies, um, you know, whatever, whatever the case may have been, Social Security. Um, so I think that in many ways the idea that we can just get rid of government programs or, or say that government is too big, I think that's oversimplified. And I, I think that the reality is if, if you look at periods of economic growth, there has always been growth that has been fueled by government spending. That's, I mean, you can look it up. <laughs> I guess well, it and that might be true. And, and, and even having like uh, some kind of a trade, uh, you know, tariffs and, and things like that, that uh, you know, f uh, fair trade also is another thing that, that you know. Yeah, that's like another of our, of our planks, and, and, and it does relate. And, you know, it's, it's it, when I, when I, when I think about, the the jobs that are sh shipped overseas all the time simply so you know someone in this country can buy a big screen tv for you know a hundred dollars less than than they would if it were manufactured here it's just mind-boggling um and and we have to i've you know i'm i'm not necessarily protectionist but i'm also by no means a globalist um you know local economies need local solutions and and we have to understand that 
by by sending all of our work overseas and then paying to ship the products that are made back, we're not only doing damage to our own economy, we're doing huge damage to our environment. We're doing, I mean, the the you know the the effects are are multitudinous. So so you you know if you're not willing to look at at, at the big picture. Um, you, you're never going to find the kinds of, of um, all-inclusive solutions that, that you know, are accommodated. Okay. So those are both. two issues, like two other issues that might be some disagreement is education and, and, and health care. But now taking those away, the issues that are probably definite agreements are, are the peace first one um, and uh, human rights, civil rights, election reform, corporate accountability reform. Um, and uh, so those are huge, huge issues. I mean, I, th I think it's a matter of priorities. I mean, out of 300 million people, no one's ever going to agree on, on, on everything. And, uh, and But the war, it, it's such, I mean, the empire spending, I'll call it, like the about the trillion dollars a year that we spend. Um, it's it, insane. It's, it's huge. I mean, that's, that's a yeah. huge issue just by itself. And just all the reverberations that would come with it if we did have true peace, um, you know, friendship with other countries and, and, and try to trade with them. Like maybe we could try to trade with Iran and, and build a kind of a dependent relationship where we wouldn't, you know, want to go to war with them, um, kind of like we're trying to do with China and stuff. And uh um, and I do see that you wrote some nice things about Ron Paul on, on the um, free and equal. If people haven't uh, heard of free and equal, but that that's, um, yeah. you know, there were other presidential debates. Uh, there were great debates, too. I mean, it was Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party versus um, Jill Stein, basically, of the Green Party. And they had two other people in the first round. Um, uh, yeah. Virgil Good and um, Rocky Anderson. But um, yep. th then they you know, narrowed it down to just the final two contenders by people, you, you know, the audience voting for who they wanted to see in the next one. That's how they did it in 2012. And it was a very, very, um, you know, great debate. Uh, and on, on their website, it shows the sponsors and it, it shows new progressive Alliance. And, um, so it, it yeah, we were really pleased to be, to be a part of that because it, it, we feel that it's the only way to start, you know, to start expanding the discussion. And, um, it's, uh, it, you know, the other, the other piece, and I guess, you know, maybe I, I guess we're getting close on time here, but I'll just, I'll just briefly say that, um, you know, we, we feel that it's, it's just really important for anyone who wants to get involved. And we are number one, we're a 100% volunteer organization. I don't get any salary. In fact, I've put so much of my own money into this already that my wife, uh, sometimes thinks I'm crazy, but, um, but we, if you have a pay, better world, it's going to pay off, isn't it? I mean, because, well, I mean, you, it, you hope so. It's practical but, but that's as what, well. I mean, even if it wasn't practical, I mean, I'm sure you'd still do it. But the bottom line is, if our country was had a healthier economy because we spent more wisely, there's a healthier population, better environment, etc. Um, you, you know, your money didn't just go down the drain. I mean, and, and that's how everyone should see well, it. Well, and maybe home. it happens. I I hope so. And maybe it happens in my generation, and maybe it doesn't but but the real takeaway for me has been that if it doesn't happen for me maybe it happens for my kids and the more that people can start to think that way the more that people can can stop saying well you know I'm never going to see it so why should I work for it cuz I hear that a lot and it's really unfortunate well, hopefully we care enough be... about the yeah. future that that we're willing to put our time into it now and if if we see some of it great but if we don't you know what maybe the next generation will yeah, and thankfully, people before us thought the same thing. You know, exactly. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm exactly. Sure. It takes it takes some real selflessness, and I think I think we can find it. But um, it's going to be a multi generational journey. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, the game's going to be over for you, you know uh, pe people at at some. I mean, might as well do something that that you truly feel passionate about, and. Uh, um, so, I mean, the, the real practical solution is, I mean, endorsing people, making people aware about candidates. Um, I think the free and equal thing was very important because the, the, the way for these candidates, I mean, um, I mean, it, every candidate, I mean, f more fair election laws is another thing that, that you refer to. I mean, I think every, anyone who made themselves on the ballot, who got enough signatures, uh, who are going to be on a public ballot, um, this is public information, should... 
uh, be in the debates. Um, I, I mean, to, to yep. leave them out is almost, um, you, you know, uh, criminal. It's almost should, like should a, be criminal. Yeah, one of one of our steering committee members is Richard Winger, who is just doing phenomenal work on ballot access. He publishes ballot access news. And for 12 bucks a year, you can find out about all the ballot access battles that are going on all over the country. It's money well spent. Richard is just a genius, and um, I would recommend uh, his publication to anyone. Great. Uh, well, um, and, and that's that's the main question. I mean, I can think of lots of different, like, uh, uh, you, you know, um, short uh, quotes and, and things to say to inspire people to, you know, like, don't tread on me, or I'd rather, you know, live on my feet than die on my knees and, and all that hurrah type of stuff. But I mean, really, the, 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 the question is, and I have this here on, on our website, is, is not whether to vote, whether you should vote for an independent or a third party. Rather, it's why do um, the Republicans and the Democrats um, disallow equal competition? I mean, it's not a matter of, like, I'm not telling you who you should vote for, but but the question even before that in, in, in this layered onion of politics is, um, and, and free, you, you know, having a free democratically elected republic, uh, public that's uh, fully informed uh, so they can make a fully informed decision is... Um, I mean, if, if they're doing it to the independents and third party candidates, like leaving them out of the debates, um, it's even, because they're scared, it's what well, they're doing it to you, too. I mean, maybe some people don't want to associate themselves with the independents and third parties. They don't want to feel powerless. They want they don't want to feel like um, I mean, if, if you don't think that's true, I mean, maybe some people who are listening should, should try to run as an independent and third party and, and, and see if, um, you know, you can break through that. But I mean, ain't that the truth? <laughs> Yeah, they've made it very, very difficult, and, and it's because they know that if, if such a movement gathers steam, they're in trouble. So, you know, we need to give them a little trouble. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, really fun. I mean, why are they not in the debates it should be the question, and um, I, I mean, it's just... Yeah, and Free and Equal did a nice job of asking it, I think. I really do. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, kind of a... Uh, I don't, a question that 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 is just as much of a statement, but um, I, I mean that that's a real fundamental question. I hope people go away with is is why don't I see all my options? How come I, I cannot be? How come they're trying to hide information? And I think obvious answers, like like you said, is because they're scared. Um, if the truth was out, um, so if that's the case, then why are we voting for them? I mean, uh, if we can't make a fully informed decision, then. Uh, then we're making decisions where, like, uh, you know, the person who goes on the Internet and just starts clicking stuff. I mean, you might as well just close your eyes and, and, and just, cl you know, just try to dot well, in the and, candidates. And, Tom, you know, the answer is it comes back to what you said earlier. Not everybody is as involved in politics as, as folks like you and I and, and others who, who work for these organizations, you know, and give of their time 24-7. You know, in general, the American electorate, apart from only about half the people participating, which is sad, um, you know the the folks who do it they're they're engaged for for maybe when the debates start that's that's when they first are even conscious of of the election occurring meanwhile you know you and I are already talking about 2014 and 2016 so so a lot of it is just the way that people are indoctrinated into the electoral system and and so there is a lot of work that has to be done um, at the early stages of people's development to help them understand that, you know, the only way you're really going to get the choices that the Constitution, you know, promises you are by insisting upon them. So, you, I mean, um, that, that's, so your uh, vision, your plans, uh, events, um, we, you know, we have just uh, about one or two more minutes here. I mean, uh, uh, what's happening uh, in 2013 and 14? Like, we are looking our, that forward, and, and, and what's New Progressive Alliance uh, looking forward to there? Our, our strategy now, we were founded uh, about three years ago, and um, as crazy as this sounds, that is not a lot of time to get an organization up and running and, and endorsing candidates and a platform. So we, we achieved all that in those three years. And our focus now for the next two years is to get people on the ground in every state of the nation, um, volunteers who are willing to work with us to help uh, spread the word and to found local state state branches of the NPA. We're not a political party. We reserve the right to become one at some time, although that's really not our goal. Our, our goal is to create an atmosphere where existing and other new political parties 
have an opportunity to gain support, get on the ballot, and to do that by um, pledging to uphold what we feel are really foundational progressive beliefs. And, and by progressive, again, I'm, I'm referring to the progressive era, not, not the progressivism that uh, the liberal Democrats have sort of co-opted uh, because they're afraid to be called liberal. Yeah, and 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 get. I mean, terms like progressive, libertarian. I mean, you know, there there are labels, um, and in used to define like a bunch of definitions into you know something that's compressed into a word. But uh, I mean, it, it's the platforms and the definition. I think that's what matter. I, I mean, like here. I think it's good news to hear that you you know you did um, endorse some libertarians. I think it was good news when I interviewed people to see that there were Green Party organizations that uh, in 2012 I have seen that endorsed libertarians and vice versa. Or if they were in a district where you know they were is just one or you know they only had one other third party candidates in that district, which we try to focus on were in districts where there was only one third party or independent candidates. Um, so uh, there's more to unite on. I, I think it's, you know, that if, if we're sick of getting like 3% every year, I mean, we do need to build some kind of coalition. And um, there's no question. There's no question. And just, fo- and at least focus. I mean, if all we did was just end the empire and maybe end the drug war, I mean, that's a good start right there. And, and that's going to snowball into other things, I believe. But um, I, I think you're right, Tom. I really, appreciate you taking the time well it's been a pleasure tony and uh, so um let me give your website one more time here it's uh new progs um is uh how how you would spell it um n-e-w-p-r-o-g-s dot org and so with people and organizations like you out there it gives a lot of hope appreciate your time and uh we'll have this uh published soon and uh and keep in touch thanks a lot tony thank you bye-bye